I think that being vegan or just trying to eat less meat is hard in society. I mean, this is one reason why I've been excited about the potential of alternative proteins and plant-based mm -hmm. meat in mm -hmm. particular is I think that they can substitute in so easily in a lot of those settings where, you know, McDonald's is not going to offer a lentil dish, but, you know, maybe it could offer a veggie burger. And I think that's the same thing in a lot of these settings is it just makes it easier. And I think that the friction, the difficulty of eating less meat or not eating meat is really one of the chief impediments, as you say. So the easier we can make it, the better. Hi, everyone. And welcome to the Switch for Good podcast. Dotsie and I are here today with a wonderful guest that I'm excited to introduce to you. And as you all know, around the world, there are tens of billions of non-human animals trapped in the barbaric system of industrial animal ag. And unfortunately, that number is increasing, as we're going to discuss today. It's a really severe problem, and not just for the suffering of animals, but for human health and the health of our planet. And a challenge of this magnitude can leave many of us hoping that someone else is just going to come along and fix it. And fortunately for the animals and all of us, there are people out there dedicating their lives to doing just that. And today we are shining a spotlight on one of these really remarkable individuals. Lewis Bollard is a dedicated animal advocate making change on a global scale. He is the Farm Animal Welfare Director at Open Philanthropy, which is a funder addressing important and often neglected causes. And prior to working there, Lewis was the policy advisor and international liaison to the CEO at the Humane Society of the United States, also known as HSUS, more familiarly. He also writes a newsletter that I get and I recommend, and it's why I asked him on the show because I was so interested in all that he was writing. Lewis has a law degree from Yale and a BA from Harvard, and he's putting his education to great use because every day Lewis is fighting for a more ethical world and working to end factory farming once and for all. So Lewis, thank you for being on the show today. It's really great to have you. Thank you. And thanks for those kind words. I'm excited to join you. So starting off, tell us a little bit about what happened in your life to make you such a fierce advocate for animals. Yeah. So when I was a a teenager, we went on a, a trip to Southeast Asia. And I remember first we went to a restaurant in Southern China where they had a, a butcher's shop within the restaurant. They wanted to show you how fresh the meat was. And so they were killing all kinds of animals there. And I was, I remember just being kind of repulsed by this. And then funnily enough, my reaction at the time was that I forced my parents to take us to the one McDonald's in the city. I was like, here, I don't need to see the slaughter. It's, you know, it's all good. Uh, but I think that had kind of planted a seed. And then I saw a, a live animal market in Vietnam on the same trip. And just seeing graphically what was being done to these animals, initially my my impression was, oh, this is just something that happens here. Uh, but I think that had planted the seed. And as I started to do some more research and learn more, I realized that's how animals are treated everywhere. And the only difference in the United States or in New Zealand where I grew up was that it's being done behind behind closed doors. Yeah, like what Paul McCartney said, if uh, slaughterhouses had glass walls, most of us would be vegetarians. Um, is that now, like you said, your story is so emblematic of so many of us, um, because it took me 33 years to go from vegetarian to vegan, because I was I had many, many reasons why all very intellectual. It's not until you get sort of it's it can sometimes be an emotional thing that can that can really help you make the switch. So sur in surveys, humans, and you've written about this, they vastly disapprove of abusing animals. They don't like factory farms, but they still keep eating them and exploiting them in so many ways. So can you talk a little bit about what you think is going on with humans that even though we verbally say we don't want to go to that restaurant that butchers them. We are fine with going to McDonald's and eating the meat anyway. Yeah. So I, I think one of the toughest things we have to battle with is just inertia and the status quo where humans do things they do because they've always done them that way. And because their parents did them and because the people around them do them, they sort of assume it must be fine and it must be okay. And, you know, we also know from a lot of these surveys that people assume the meat they're buying was treated the animals behind it were treated far better than they were, that people assume that farmers are treating animals well and that retailers have standards and all these things that are just not the case. 
Um, but it also, I mean, speaking to your point on on the value of emotions, I do think for a lot of people, it's one thing to have a sense that, well, something's bad about factory farming. I I disapprove of that. It's another to actually be confronted with the horrors of it. And one thing factory farming has done very successfully has hidden itself from from public view so that consumers don't see the reality of how the animals behind the meat they're eating were treated. And so they don't have to confront with that. Do you think that most people who make a significant change that sticks have to eventually see that reality? I think it's I think it's a key key step for a lot of people. I don't know if everyone needs to have that. I think for some people it's enough just just having positive experiences with animals and and understanding some people make that connection between their relationship with their dog and their cat or or other animals and the animals they're eating. Um, but I do think that for a lot of us who have become most passionate about this, yeah. one key step in that was seeing a video, was seeing a leaflet, was was perhaps yeah. even going onto a farm mm -hmm. and just seeing these what these conditions are actually like. It, it, it seems to me, you know, what you brought up in, in the beginning, this that that socialization that, you know, I feel like we're we're humans just on the treadmill of just it, so many people just want to do what the next person does, what the average is, what it seems to be, you know, the, the collective says is is OK. And this is, you know, how we're going to do things and follow that instead of, you know, taking a hard left or a hard right like we have and be like, ah, yeah, no, I'm going to stand up. This isn't okay and be this little teeny tiny percent. People don't like that feeling. We just had Louis Facias on the podcast last week, and he and I were talking about the the effect, of, you know, after Game Changers, you know, a lot of people made a shift. And then about a year, year and a half later, uh, was, I started having almost every conversation was the same. Oh, oh, I saw the movie. It was great. Did you make a change? Yes, I did. It was amazing. I lost 50 pounds. I felt incredible. I had so much more energy. And I'm like, great. How are you doing it now? They're like, uh, well, I stopped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what what happened? And most of the answers are, well, it was weird at a restaurant. Mm -hmm. I felt strange in front of my friends. I didn't want to be that person. <sighs> what do we do with that? Yeah, I think that's a real challenge. I mean, I think that being vegan or or just trying to eat less meat is is hard in society. I mean, when fast food chains just sell all these meat heavy items, when uh, friends and relatives are going to produce those those meals for us, I mean, this is one reason why I've been excited about the potential of alternative proteins and and plant based mm -hmm. meat in mm -hmm. particular is. I think that they can substitute in so easily in a lot of those settings where, you know, McDonald's is not going to offer a lentil uh, dish, but, you know, m maybe it could offer a veggie burger. And uh -huh. I think that that's, that's the same thing in a lot of these settings is it just makes it easier. And I think that the the friction, the difficulty of eating less meat or or not eating meat uh, is really one of the, the chief impediments, as you say. So the easier we can make it, the better. Do you think that you are uh, working farm animal policy, you talk about it? Do all these factors, convenience, having some kind of an emotional tie to our decisions, like loving an animal or seeing the terror, the horror of killing mm -hmm. an animal um, and education, do these all need to be there? What, what, are, what are your feelings about how change happens in people? Long-term change, by the way. Yeah, I think that's the million dollar question. And I I don't pretend to have all the answers on that one. I mean, I think there's a role, I think there's a role for a lot of different things. Uh and and we're still, you know, at a relatively early stage in this movement. So I think it makes sense to be doing a lot of experimenting, trying out different approaches, seeing what works and and doing more of the things that work. Um, I think that from what we've seen historically, yeah, it matters. Education definitely matters. I think there's a risk though that you just focus on awareness raising. And you know, we also need to drive people to action. And we need to drive people to action. We need to drive companies to action, governments to action. And so, you know, in our case, we we focus most of our our efforts on on trying to get that action component um going. But I I think there is definitely a role for all of these uh, for all of these approaches in, in the movement. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. I think that they all support each other. And the the because they for one thing, if you have fringe actions like um investigation, undercover investigations or protests, those help make the other actions like changing policy so much more palatable to the average person. Mm -hmm. So you need all aspects of a movement to be working. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think I think one really nice um, 
change we've seen over the last decade is advocates working together better across the movement. I mean, I think this used to be a movement that was quite divided where everyone kind of, you know, it was, it was, there were the people who just cared about ethics and the people who just cared about health. And there were the abolitionists and the welfareists, and there were all these different sort of teams uh, often fighting one another. And I think we've really seen seen that sort of breaking down and we've seen um, people increasingly working together and realizing, yeah, there's a role for everyone and, and Mm -hmm. that we are definitely stronger together as a movement. I'm just curious about always curious worldwide, the hierarchy of animals in people's minds. That's always such a strange thing. I'm living in Mexico uh, this winter and uh, it's, it, it here with dogs it's there there it's 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 literally one extreme or the other they absolutely fall down to pet by dog who was cabo san lucas street dog mm-hmm. uh and the children just go flying towards her which that doesn't happen in the states you know the mm-hmm. parents are like no no you know can't mm-hmm. but just 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 envelop in her it, mm-hmm. it, and so there again our, our our natural sense to to really be drawn to uh, the, the four leggings, most of them. Uh, but then you also, I see people who will cross the entire side of the street to the other side of the street to avoid going by my dog, who who doesn't really look vicious uh, at all. And so there's this clear hierarchy. Some of them here, I think this th- things have happened to people, right? They got attacked mm-hmm. by a dog probably because they were doing something to it awful, uh, potentially, because they don't normally behave that way unless they're starving. Uh but it's, and then I'm always fascinated by, I'm sure you guys will think of more animals, but I had rabbits growing up and those are pets and we eat them and we test on them and we use their fur. It's the, it's, it's, I'm sure there's a few more, like I said, you guys, that's the one animal that we just like, it's, it's the whole spectrum. And then there's animals that are just not, you know, are just only fit into one of those kind of like, we just eat them. We don't do anything mm-hmm. else. What, how did it, how did that even begin. It must go back since the beginning of, of, of humans, but what it historically, like what, yeah. What do you have to share with us and digging in on that? Yeah. I mean, I think historically you see different animals were domesticated for different purposes and, Mm -hmm. you know, you see this across different societies where some societies, dogs are pets and some society dogs are meat. Uh, and there is, there really is this, um, this variety historically of, purposes that we put to it. I think the rabbit you mentioned is a great example because people often say, well, you know, like we care about dogs and cats and things because they're smarter, because they're mammals, because they're rabbits have all these characteristics. I mean, they're even cute, you know, I mean, they've got, they've got it all. (laughs) And, uh, and yet we've still, you know, we're still willing to farm them. We're still willing to experiment on them. And, and so I, you know, I really think the, the big distinction is, are these animals that we can profit from or are these animals that we have like welcomed into our family or or enjoy in the wild? And I think that's comes down to so much of it. We, because we've brought cats and dogs into our home because certain wild animals we've come to revere in nature, we support protections from them, but the animals that we rely on for food, we don't support those protections for. And, and you see this, you know, even you see this, I think in, in um, societies where for instance, rabbit meat is common, Rabbits have very few legal protections. They have a lot more legal protections in the U.S. because we don't rely on their meat here. Um, but right. you know, then pigs don't have those legal protections, and so there there is just a crazy arbitrariness to the animals that we have decided to call pets or to call friends and to protect, and the ones that we have decided to eat, to use, and to, to have no protections. Mm-hmm. You wrote uh, and in one of your um, articles that, that I received, you write every other month, I think, right? So yeah, that's right. People sign up, they won't get inundated, but your <laughs> articles are are quite deep and long, but um very interesting and not hard to read, folks. So it's not like <laughs> it's very conversational. Um, you'll come out a better person. You wrote something about a Sinclair study that found that people from 14 countries scored chickens as highly as dogs, whilst fish came ahead of turtles. I mean, it mm. seems like it has to do so much with culture. And it's interesting because when you were when you were speaking, answering Dotsie's uh, comment is that you said, you know, we, we, we. And it's because humans, we are so anthropocentric. It's all about how they affect us and mm. not their own beings. You, you know mm. what I'm saying? And I think that's the problem 
in for so many reasons, it's why we have climate change too uh, issues. <laughs> so, Lewis, can you expound on that? Yeah. So the, the study you're referring to, uh, Michelle Sinclair and colleagues. Uh, coordinated a survey across a really wide variety of countries. I think they had in there everywhere from United States and China through to Pakistan and Nigeria. And they in particular asked about chickens and fish, which are globally the most abused farm animals. I mean, just the numbers of chickens and the number of fish far surpass any other any other species globally. And the assumption has always been that people really don't care about them. I mean, that's certainly what it looks like from the way we treat them and from the way the laws treat them. But what they found is that in a lot of these societies, people actually had quite high opinions of fish and chickens. I mean, first of all, I think there were questions around, you know, whether you uh, believe they're sentient and everyone seemed to agree they were sentient. That didn't seem to be a big debate. Uh, people agreed that they that they mattered and their welfare mattered. Um, and, and so, as you say, a lot of the stuff seems to just be sort of a cultural, uh, a sort of cultural effect. Here in the United States, we've decided chickens and fish aren't important, and so we assume everyone else has the same view. Um, but you know, in reality, I think that um, there really is, and and that that study was kind of heartening to me. It suggested that there really is this widespread concern about the well-being of even you know even these sort of lesser creatures who who we normally don't don't uh, give much consideration to. Well, just right on that, as far as uh, fish go, I, I mean that seems to be the the one living being that most people, if they're plant-based, the, oh, but I eat fish. I mean, I don't, you know, we can all not even count on both hands how many times we've heard that. It's, it's so often. I think that it's still glorified as a health food. I mean, I, I don't think I know, right? Certainly in the Mediterranean diet and just in people's minds, I believe, because the media. But um, tell us why people should really care a lot more about farmed fish, not only from a suffering standpoint, but from like a health standpoint for us to be consuming farmed fish. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, you know, I think most people have an image of fish as coming from the ocean and about half of it does. I mean, there are still huge problems with the way that fish is is fished in the ocean, whether it's about the dredging of the bottom of the ocean, oh, whether it's yeah. the use of slave labor. Uh, I mean, there's there's crazy stuff that goes on with that wild caught fishing. But increasingly, fish is coming from fish farms. Uh, I mean, uh -huh. over half the world's fish now does. And that that is just increasing. I mean, every year, the amount of fish that comes from fish farms is dramatically increasing. And yeah, I mean, those those farms, uh, there was a lot of variety, I should say, because there are hundreds of different species of fish farmed and, and fish farming is still kind of the Wild West. I mean, I visited some of these fish farms in India and everyone looked different to the next one. I mean, no one's kind of worked out like a standard way of doing this. And, you know, mm -hmm. some of them look terrible and some of them look not so bad. And it um, but, you know, I mean, the gist of it is that you're taking these animals most of whom are used to swimming vast distances. I mean, that's sort of what they do. And you're putting them all in something normally the size of a swimming pool. Uh, and you're not just putting them in, you know, there with a couple of other fish. You're putting them there with a huge number of other fish. I mean, the, the size of a swimming pool, you might have 100,000 fish. Um, and so these fish are just incredibly crowded together. And then the other thing that happens is their waste. I mean, it just ends up filling up this whole pool. So by the end of it, they're just swimming in fish waste. Uh, it's also an incredibly long time to farm these animals. So it, most of them take about mm. two years uh, that they're they're in this environment before they go to slaughter. Um, so I mean, per your why? question, why they grow pretty fast? What, why is it two years? I guess I guess they don't grow fast enough for the industry's sake. I mean, I'm sure I'm <laughs> yeah. sure they're trying to I'm sure they're trying yeah. to speed that up. But uh, yeah. it's uh, the um, the for now, yeah, it's still a very long time and. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know on your question about health, about specific, you know, health animals, but I, I can't imagine that uh, eating a fish that's lived all of its life and the waste of other fish is is the healthiest thing. Certainly, one thing I do know is, I mean, most of these fish are being fed like corn and soybeans now, anyway. So the idea that they're going to get you like omega threes, like that's not, you know, this they have no source <laughs> of that. They don't have the algae or the other things that are going to get that. So, so true. I, I think that's yeah. Certainly, some of the health claims are probably not not really standing up. I never thought of that one. Sorry, Dotsie. Sorry. No, I Lewis, just never thought of that. I cut out all the uh, overlaps because <laughs> oh, Dotsie and I used to be together sitting side by side in oh, our nice. countries and states and stuff. Um, 
Lewis, talk to us about you've you've made a very good case that um, these places are horrible, raising farm fish, and that it's um, environmentally very damaging. What about the fish themselves? People always look at fish like, well, they're just fish. They don't they don't have expressions. They don't have fur. They're not cute, um, but they mm-hmm. are highly sentient, sensitive, and also they're smart. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that this is a really common misconception about fish. I mean, for the longest time, scientists had barely studied them. And when they had, they just kind of assumed they were these automatons, that they didn't feel anything. I mean, right up until like the 1990s, it was just common the common view that fish couldn't feel pain. And there was actually, there was a pioneering scientist, Victoria Braithwaite, who did a, a set of studies to show that actually these fish feel pain and they're capable of all kinds of things. And I think that's almost not disputed in the science anymore. I mean, it's just a a huge, but it's, it's still a big shift that, you know, the industry regulators, everyone has not caught up with. Uh, And, and yeah, in terms of, I mean, their complexity, one of the things that astounded me is that fish are increasingly used in animal experiments as a model for human depression. So they're inducing in fish something that they think is similar to depression. And then they're studying, you know, and, and antidepressants work on them. So antidepressants work on fish and alleviating these symptoms. So on the one hand, you've got some scientists claiming, oh, they're not that complicated. On the other hand, we're <laughs> using them as a model for one of the most complicated wow. ailments in humans and, and our drugs work. Um, so yeah, to me, it, it really suggests there's a lot more going on in the minds of fish than we understand. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it's also just a helpful cautionary tale that, you know, we we have this this uh, mistake throughout history of constantly assuming that any being we don't understand must be stupid and and must have nothing going on. And in fact, the more we've studied these animals, it's almost all gone in one direction of understanding, okay, there's actually a lot more going on than we thought there was. Yeah, it's it's that anthropocentrism. We're also measuring them against whether they can get into Yale or Harvard, right? <laughs> and so you score super high, Lewis, but the fish don't. <laughs> um, but fish actually have very high... Uh, that, yeah, it drives me crazy because fish have very sensitive sense of smell. And a lot of sea creatures whom we might totally ignore can see so much better than us. And of course, we all know about the the cheetah that can that run much faster. So there's so many animals that we um, abuse who have so many traits. I mean, I personally only care if they suffer. That's the only trait. But a lot of people want to know if some if a, a being is smart before they'll decide where they are in the hierarchy of how we should mm-hmm. treat them. Uh, do you see that a lot in your work? And that is that why you chose farm animals to focus on? Yeah, I mean, well, we chose farm animals just because of the sheer numbers. I mean, the sheer scale of, of factory farming globally in terms of tens of billions of of animals suffering. Um, but and and as you say, I mean, it is definitely especially neglected because people don't pay attention to them. I think I think that's partly, I mean, people will sometimes say, yeah, it's because they're not smart, but I'm skeptical that's what's really going on. I, I think mm. it's just convenient to not care about them and it would be really inconvenient mm. to take seriously their interests. Uh, I mean, a- as with you, I think that what ultimately matters is whether they can suffer. And I don't think, you know, I think across all these species, uh, I suspect there's a lot more going on. I suspect they're smarter than we give them credit for, but... I ultimately think that debate doesn't even really matter to to our moral obligations. Right. We just we shouldn't torture them. We shouldn't cause suffering to a being who who can suffer. Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsie and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right, Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page, that's Switch, the number four, and then Good, and then click on Groups, and there we are the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group, and tell us what you want. I have a question about um, 
fish again and 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 other mammals that live in the sea uh about ocean trolling i was in um a bay uh, outside of Mallorca, spain just sitting on uh, a stand up paddle and i'd never in ever seen live uh, a, a trolling ship arrive at port uh and i'll never forget it it wasn't that it was just a few years ago and it it you know of course when you see something in person versus a video or something it's the 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 magnitude is what hits you just that sheer massiveness of what they've done and these nets are trolling 30 40 square miles probably bigger that's what i've read uh and i'm consistently curious how long do we have before that alone kills us all cuz last time i checked when the oceans die it's over rover for all of us mm. do you have alexander might know too like stats on how much longer that can last before it's just done we're just done i i don't know i mean one thing i'll say is is that they have uh i guess they've started to impose they've they've created their own limitations because they've they've so mm -hmm. successfully dredged so much of the ocean that it's hard right. for them to pull out more fish now. And in some ways, that's actually one of the few constraints on them going further is that they, they can't catch a lot more fish. So I think for the last like three decades, they've only, they've only <laughs> been catching the same amount of fish every year uh, just because they, they can't pull any more fish out of the ocean. Uh, so I don't know, you know, if, if, if they'll find new ways to go even, even further, but mm -hmm. this is certainly what's driven the, the growth of aquaculture is they've exhausted mm -hmm. the ocean and, and now they need to, to go on land to, to, uh, find more resources. Okay. So they figured out the, the regeneration speed and they realized they had to, well, just cut it off to some degree and, and, and manage it better. Yeah, I don't know that they even necessarily did that as a conscious thing. I think that what happened is they just found that certain fisheries, there weren't any fish to be caught in anymore. And so they stopped fishing them because it wasn't worth their time going there. And that let those fisheries regenerate. <laughs> and then they started coming back again. I mean, okay. I think that's the cruel cycle to this is that they they hmm. just pull out as many fish as they can until they can't pull out anymore. And then they come back again when the fishery recovers. I see. Okay. Dotsie's giving them way too much credit. Thank you. <laughs> Jeez. This brings to mind sort of policies, and mm -hmm. um, there are places around the world that are trying to help animals because mostly, <laughs> I'm laughing because it's mostly not for the animals. It's actually for things like climate change, which are going to, you know, kill us humans. But nevertheless, you know, uh, they're they're doing it. They're making changes in how we deal with um, the animal agriculture because we know that it's bad, it's polluting, and it's bad for the environment and uh, humans' lives. So, uh, talk to us a little bit about what's going on around the world in terms of positive news about uh, governments and factory farming. Yeah, so I think there's been a number of positive developments in recent years. Um, Last year, Denmark uh, published the world's first action plan for promoting plant-based eating. And so this is a government plan that's about actively promoting plant-based food in schools, in hospitals, in the national nutrition strategy. We're seeing more governments uh, funding alternative protein research. The German government recently put up a bunch of money. So is the South Korean government, the Dutch government, the Danish government. Um and, and we're seeing some governments start to take seriously regulations as well. So the European Union was working on a set of pretty ambitious regulations. Unfortunately, they've gotten stalled for now, um, but hopefully they will get picked up again. Um, so I think there is there is this growing recognition. It's still far too slow. I mean, it's still far too little. But I think that we have seen increased progress from the world's governments relative to where they were a decade ago. There's a city in the uh, Holland, the Netherlands, that has banned meat ads because they of climate change. They feel that I don't, I don't know. If, do they sell meat there too? I'm not sure. Do you know, Lewis? I don't know. Mm, okay. Um, what what are you focusing on in terms of farmed animals that you feel is most important for you personally because of your passions? Yeah. So I mean, I think. Um... I'm really excited about our work on alternative proteins and trying to accelerate the 
development of better alternative proteins and their adoption globally. Mm -hmm. I'm excited about work to hold corporations responsible and to to raise their animal welfare standards to get rid of some of the worst practices like battery cages and gestation crates. Um, I'm excited about work to get the world's governments to to legislate. Uh, and one other thing I'd say is is just building up the movement globally of people who care about this, particularly in parts of the world that have been traditionally neglected. So one thing we've done a lot of is supporting work in Asia, uh, in East Asia, Southeast Asia, where there are, there are advocates who already care about these issues, but just haven't been able to have access to resources previously. And I think it's really exciting seeing those advocates finally have resources, being able to work on this full time, being able to build up a movement within those countries that can hopefully do something really, um, really promising in the long run. In didn't South Korea, just be yeah. didn't South Korea just ban meat, a dog meat, and and that was largely because of local activists, but they were supported. But I mean, I know by supported by uh, Western animal rights groups, um, but they we. We here in the West couldn't have done it without ha having local people on the ground being supported. Yeah, that's right. In fact, our um, our dog is a rescue from a South Korean dog meat farm, and uh, uh, so yeah, that was that was nice to see that that particular practice going by the wayside. I think it does speak to globally. We see as people get richer, they although they unfortunately eat more meat, they also are more likely to have companion animals. They're more likely to have a view that they want to get rid of some of those worst cruelties. And so we've seen this in China and South Korea around dog meat, where there's a lot of domestic mm -hmm. opposition to the dog meat trade. And I hope that we'll see that that kind of sentiment also flow over into concern for farm animals. In in talking about plant-based cultured meat, the, the future there, um, you have written a blog, and I'm sure more than just that, on why you think plant-based meat has kind of lost its it's luster. And when we look at plant-based plant dairy, meaning just the milk, we haven't nailed the cheeses yet, but the, the milk is at almost 19% almost of the market. And I have not the palate anymore to judge because I've been vegan for so long now, but um, it seems to me that it's possible that the plant-based milks, like we've nailed those. There's, there's so many of them. There's such a wide variety and they're delicious. I, we feel like we've definitely nailed the meats, right? Like all, all, all of us. I mean, I was like, this is freaking delicious. This is beyond thing. I mean, we have them, I don't know, probably more than we should. Uh, <laughs> but the, the typical meat consumers, like, uh, uh, it's, it's just, it, it hasn't, it, it really hasn't happened. It hasn't been nailed. What? Why do you think it's lost its luster in the in the marketplace and 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 how can it how can we get it back? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it's it's been so uh, unfortunate to see the market for plant-based meat doing so poorly over the last couple of years after it had such an incredible boom right. during COVID and it gone so well. And as you say, the the contrast with plant-based milk is is really stuck where plant-based milk has just done so well over a sustained period of time. I don't know what accounts for that difference. I, I do think in surveys, we see that people are more dissatisfied with the taste of plant-based meat than with the taste of plant-based milks. Um, that may be because the plant-based meats aren't as good yet, or it may be because people prefer, like people don't actually like the taste of milk as much in the first place, and and so they were ready. I mean, one of the things kind of interesting with like soy milk, almond milk, oat milk, is they don't taste the same as dairy milk, uh, or at least, I mean, I haven't had dairy milk in a while, but I don't yeah, think they taste right. the same. And, um, and, and whereas, you know, it, it, it might just be that people like weren't that into the taste of dairy milk. Uh, unfortunately, I think it's just a tougher challenge. My sense is people are really yeah. into the taste of certain meats. And hopefully as we develop better products, we can, we can, yeah. uh, you know, really meet those taste expectations. Um, but I think there also needs to be better marketing around this. I mean, one of the things that I think has, has hurt the industry is this perception that plant-based meats are unhealthy, the perception that they're overly processed. Right. Um, yeah. The and, companies did uh, yeah, a absolutely. zinger and, of a job on that. Yeah. Yeah, they really did. And and I think that um, I think that's been a real challenge for the industry along, alongside a whole bunch of other factors. So mm -hmm. I think I think it will take some time. I think it will involve a lot, a lot of advocacy, a lot of marketing and and better products. But I'm I'm hopeful we can yeah. we can get get things going well again. Yeah, I think, or I know for sure with the dairy, because that's a, a lot of the work I'm involved in, is dairy makes people feel like crap. 
most people and they, you know, you experience it. And, and it, I never realized what an in into plant paste dropping dairy first will be as opposed to dropping meat. Cause if somebody drops, if somebody like stops having their turkey sandwich, they're going to feel zero difference if for a really long time until their arteries catch up and go, Oh yeah, yeah, this is more fluid, but dairy for people, it can be 12 hours, right? If they're lactose intolerance, which is, you know, 73% of the entire world, or they just have a sensitivity. It bloats them. It, it a lot of people have the inflammation of it creates eczema, psoriasis. I mean, the list is endless. And when people go, Oh my God, this is who, why didn't someone tell me about this? They get excited and amped up and they start looking for the alternatives because they want to have that same experience. But I don't think they like the taste and the, and the way they feel is just, it's so massive. And that doesn't happen with a hamburger, right? You have to have a thousand hamburgers and then realize that, you know, you're going to have to be cut asunder to open up and have surgery, heart surgery to clean out the, the butter and the hamburger. Um, so the immediacy, right. That, and, and that's, that's what so many of us are after. Just in general, yeah. That, in no, I, I hadn't heard that previously, but that makes a lot of sense to me. I think that, yeah, I've seen a lot of people who just like are really not into dairy and didn't like how it made them feel. And it, just anecdotally, a lot of my non veg friends have given up dairy milk uh, and just feel better and, and prefer having having plant-based milk. So yeah, I think if we could evoke some of that similar feeling on the plant-based meat side, I think that'd probably be really, really yeah. helpful. There is the window into getting everyone to stop everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just... Yeah, you know, what's interesting, Lewis, is that, and I was surprised that we've been doing this for we've over 280 episodes or something. And the doctors we have on, every single one of them has said that dairy, it's more important for your health to give up dairy than it is to give up meat, except for one. And the, it was because the cancer study about processed meat had just come out. And I think, you know, he, so that was high in his mind. I mean, yeah, he, he might very much still believe that, but um, yeah. So we, we focus a lot on meat. I have a question too just came to mind when y'all were talking about the taste of meat. Isn't meat like quite bland and we put stuff on it like salt and things like that? I mean, it's not, is it, it might be the umami-ness of the meat that people really miss, but. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good point. Uh, I mean, that's sort of my vague recollection of, of meat as a, as a fairly bland thing, particularly chicken, which I mean, you know, the, the crazy thing is beef and and pork, the two meats that are, well, particularly beef that is more distinctive, have been in decline. Uh, you know, they've been in sort of serial decline for the last few decades, whereas chicken is the thing that has just been on the up and up. And yeah, I think chicken is probably the blandest of the meats. Uh, so it is it is odd to me. And I think that had also given me hope that, you know, substitutes um, could could do better. I mean, a, a friend of mine is not veg, particularly when, when uh, Panda Express had their Beyond Orange Chicken. He claimed he couldn't tell the difference between that and the the regular chicken because either way you're mostly tasting a lot of orange sauce, um, <laughs> but the uh, yeah and salt and all the rest of it. Uh, but um, yeah, so I, I I totally agree. I I don't fully understand it. I think there's also I mean part of it I think is this taste thing. I think part of it is this deeply ingrained view that that chicken is healthy and good for you because my sense is that people have sort of slowly woken up to red meats not being good for them. Uh, and, but, but unfortunately the message that is, has gotten in is eat chicken instead and chicken's the healthy meat. And that's, you know, that's the one that you should, you should eat for, for your health. And, and for me, because I buy cat meat, cat food for my, um, cats, I pick beef because I feel like their lives are, have, are so much better than any other of the farm animals, um, because they usually get to go outside, um, and they're not confined as tightly as so many of the other uh, farmed animals are. What's going on in Florida? I saw on your Twitter page, you you retweeted some articles about Florida and they're trying to ban cultivated meat. If you could, oh, I wanted to just say one thing. Price is an issue. Hmm. The, 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 meat, the, the meats that are in the grocery store, I understand, are less expensive than the impossible and the the, the meats, a lot of the meats. So that might be also something. Um, but cultivated meat is something that's coming up. Can you explain what cultivated meat is and share with us what's been going on in Florida to try and ban and other states to try and ban cultivated meat? Yeah. So cultivated meat is a is a new approach that involves 
growing animal cells and then basically taking those animal cells, combining them into what would be, by all, for all kinds of purposes, a piece of meat. It's just a piece of meat that doesn't require you to slaughter an animal. Um, now, this is still very early on. There are a couple of companies working on this. There, there are a few first sales of this in the world, in Singapore and in the US. There are some very limited sales of this in restaurants, but it's still very early on in the technology, and there's a long way for it to be scaled up. Uh, but what we've seen, unfortunately, over the last year or two is it really getting embroiled in the culture wars. And this first happened in Italy, where the far right government in Italy decided to ban cultivated meat. And it was pretty clearly a just kind of populist gesture to the farmers, a way of showing that, you know, they were against the liberals and all that sort of thing. And now we're seeing this come to the US. And so a number of states, including Florida, a number of all Republican states, uh, advancing bills to ban the sale of cultivated meat. In the case of Florida, uh, Governor Ron DeSantis has endorsed the ban and said he'll sign it if it if it makes it into law. The good news is these bans are almost certainly illegal. Uh, so because only the federal government has the authority to regulate this kind of thing, um, states can't ban it. Um, but it's still, I think it's still a really unfortunate thing to see cultivated meat becoming this politicized. And you know, it obviously creates the risk that politicians try and take this up at the federal level, and that they try and then try and then ban it at the federal level. What's the timeline? Do you think for cultivated yeah. meat are, are the um, are the the work that needs to be done mostly on bringing the price down, or is it super easy to make cultivated meat <laughs> from the cells of a chicken that you haven't tortured? Yeah, unfortunately, it's really hard. So oh. I think the timeline is going to be a long one, and people are going to need to be patient and particularly patient in continuing to support this work and this research. The, the challenge is is one of just is just price and just scaling, but it's a, it's a big challenge. I mean, right now, you've basically got a product that relies on a whole lot of medical grade inputs. And those medical grade inputs are incredibly expensive. And so the process is incredibly expensive. Over time, they're trying to move toward custom inputs, inputs that they've developed to be used in food and not to be used in medicine, and they don't need to meet the same requirements. And they're slowly doing that. Um, it's just, it's a complex process. And, you know, I mean, when you sort of just think about taking a cell, but the cell needs all kinds of things to grow. And then when it does grow, it needs to grow up in this bioreactor and the bioreactor needs to be kept sterile and nothing else can, you know, and so there are just, there are a whole bunch of these challenges along the way. Um, so I think there's a path um, but it is a long path, and it is a path that's going to require really, really patient support. So, on that same note, in terms of timing and how and and how much time we have, AI. What are some of the pros and cons for animals if if uh, we become more AI dependent, which we surely will? Yeah, I mean, the first one is AI could solve cultivated meat for us. I mean, it, it really, you yeah. know, a lot of these sort of technical challenges of things yeah. like how do you scale something up? It AI could be really good at that kind of challenge. Uh, so that's that's one thing I think related to that, it could help us make major improvements in plant-based meat. So, you know, insofar as the taste is, people want the taste to be exactly like chicken or they want it to have the umami or something, AI could probably help us work out how to, mm -hmm. how to do that. Uh, and, and I think AI could also help facilitate more moral change. I mean, if used in the right way, I think like social media, I think did a lot of good initially for getting people to care about factory farming. It was the first mm -hmm. time a lot of people had seen videos about factory farming. The first time people had been able to access information about it. AI in theory will have access to all the information on factory farming in the world and can bring it to you at your fingertip. Now, whether people choose to use it for that is, right. is the other challenge. I mean, people may just not want to know. Uh, on, on the negative side, I think fact AI could also supercharge factory farming. I mean, there are, there are still, you know, they're always looking for ways mm -hmm. to be more efficient. They're yeah. always looking for ways to, speed, speed, speed. yeah, to breed the animals, to grow even faster, to put animals even closer together. And, and AI could unfortunately help them to do that. Um, it could also be used to, you know, spread misinformation about factory farming. So there's, there is, I, I think that the only thing which is a sure thing is I think it will have a lot of repercussions in the space i think it will change things a lot uh and some of those things will be for good and some of them will be for bad and, and i i think we just need to work to try and really make make sure that the goods outweigh the bads what yeah. are some of the things that you're seeing in factory farms that they're doing um to try and mitigate the criticism i think Dotsie, you and i talked about you showed me 
picture. It was, I think it was cows wearing diapers. So their methane didn't get out into the, into the air or something around their mm. mouths too. Mm -hmm. They were being muzzled or something. Yeah. After. Like a mask from mm -hmm. their burps to, 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 to change that gas before it comes out. And it's, it's what, like, yeah. Yeah. It's awful. And it doesn't help human health. Um, not even sure it would really help ultimately um, climate change issues. But what are you seeing there that the farms are doing mm -hmm. to try and, you know, burnish their image? Yeah, I think they're especially doing this around climate change. I mean, the example you used is a big one of of they're trying to do everything they can to reduce the emissions of individual cows. So they're they're putting on masks to collect the methane from the burps. They're giving them vaccinations that they they claim will reduce their methane emissions, feed supplements that they claim will do the same thing. Um, I think a lot of what you're seeing is that the industry sort of doesn't have an, an answer to the fact that they are a major contributor to climate change. So what they've sort of belatedly worked out is rather than rather than trying to resist that, they're going to play along with it, but just use really piecemeal solutions and things that you know mm -hmm. either are cost neutral or they can actually get money from the government to do. And so the US Department of Agriculture has set aside a lot of money to pay farmers to do more climate-friendly techniques. Uh, and so they're doing things like this. They're doing things like methane digesters. Um, and all these things, I, I imagine they do all reduce emissions a bit at, at the margin, you know, but the um, obviously they don't get at the the core problems of, of factory farming. And that's sort of by design. I mean, I think that's sort of by design that the industry says, you know, there's only so far we're willing to go. Yeah, you see a lot of farms that have solar panels on them <laughs> to and, and, and I'm all for solar panels, but uh, it does not make up for what's going on in that farm in my mind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, the other thing that's crazy is like, we're paying for all of those. I mean, it's it's almost all of this stuff is funded by taxpayer dollars. It's not it's not as if the factory farms are doing this out of the goodness of their hearts. Uh, it is they've just found a new a new revenue stream in in government environmental subsidies. And as you say, it's you know it's it's good they're putting on uh, they're putting solar solar panels up there, but it's it's a very small good compared to the harm they're doing. What, what advice would you give to someone listening to the podcast? It's that sometimes we'll hear people say, oh, I'm not really doing anything. I mean, I'm vegan, but I don't talk about it much or I don't share or and, and they're looking for they, they really want to make a, a positive impact on, on animals lives, but um, sometimes just aren't sure where to start. What advice would you give them? Yeah, so a couple of thoughts. I mean, one is if, if they're active on social media, I think that's a great place to help spread positive messages. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you can be really thoughtful about like, what are the messages that are actually going to resonate with your network? And and so, you know, probably not just yelling all the time, but sort of putting out positive <laughs> messages on. that can actually inspire people. Uh, <laughs> the um, And then, you know, I think there are a couple of things. So one of them is a lot of animal groups have volunteer networks you can get involved with. So Mercy for Animals has a has a uh, network. The Humane League has a network. Uh, so I would look up some of the groups, you know, whichever group you feel most aligned with and see, do they have a volunteer network that I could I could get involved with? And then if you have, if you have the the willingness, the ability to get more engaged, uh, there are conferences, um, there are, you know, books you can read. I'd love to see more people writing about this stuff. I mean, I think one thing, like we could use more people just blogging about it and writing more online and, and just getting more of the discussion going. I think sometimes I think one of the, the chief challenges our issue faces is that it's just not out there enough. I mean, it's it's there, there aren't enough people talking about factory farming. There aren't enough people talking about this crisis. And so, you know, I mean, they could they could start a podcast as uh, as, as you have. Like, I, I think that, um, you know, any anything that sort of provides an ability to amplify the importance of factory farming uh, is is doing a real service. Thank well, you you're so doing much. a real service. Yeah. yeah, you're doing a real service because you you are amplifying the problems with factory farming and the situation out there. So thank you. Thanks. Appreciate you being on. Thank you. That was you. like a, a, a pretty quick schooling. I mean, you were, <laughs> <laughs> we love guests like you. No ramble. It's all goodness and all <laughs> stats and all facts just packed into it. I love it. <laughs> Thanks nice. so much. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.